Larry Fink, of course, starting to come out and do a little bit of discussion around the success of the ETF, but also maybe where is the next move for BlackRock? We're going to break it all down for you. You guys will love it. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into Tech Path. Before we get started, I want to talk about self-custody. Self-custody is one of the things that I think a lot of people may be starting to experiment with around Bitcoin and other digital assets. Of course, one of the things you can do is go over to Tangem. Just go to their, visit their website, tangem.com. You'll get a chance to get into their self-custody wallet, and it's very simple to use, as you can kind of see. Pretty cool how it's used from a card to an app, and very functional, easy to set up, uh, super simple for those who want self-custody to make it easy. And all you have to do to get a, a wallet is go over here and order your cards. It's that simple. Uh, it'll, they'll mail right to you. And of course, make sure and get the three card set. It's the best way to have that extra backup when you go into self-custody and start down that rabbit hole. All right, I want to get into a few clips here today. And we'll play a handful of them toward the end of the show and break down the success of the ETF, but also where is the next big narrative starting to brew? Because there are some very interesting things that both Wall Street and I think in general uh, are starting to move to maybe a new narrative. This, of course, is Larry Fink on the ETF success. Listen in. We were very happy with the flows. It appears that we received about 40 percent of the flows yesterday. I mean, one day doesn't make it. Are these new customers? Are these people who um, are coming out of other funds? I mean, Grayscale is the biggest player <clears throat> yeah, in this yeah. space right now. Are you trying to take, you know, take share from them in terms of take, taking those clients over? Over the long run, do we believe, just think about the fee differential between an ETF and some of these trusts. Right. These trusts are like 120 basis points. Very expensive. We were talking <clears throat> with, and, with the, the head of Grayscale yesterday. And, it's still an expensive and, product. And these are 20 to 30 basis points in the ETF wrapper. Well, it's expensive, by the way, for if you're a Grayscale customer to sell your shares. Well, it's very taxes. expensive. See, and this is something you may want to ask Gary. The industry asked to transfer in kind into an ETF, and that was denied by the SEC. That, um, that creates an opportunity, actually, for, for Grayscale to keep those customers for a much longer time. It does, but I think over the long run, when you start adding up the fees and adding up the fees, uh, people are going to start thinking about um, redeeming and then ultimately going into an ETF. So interesting statement there from Larry Fink, uh, going right at Grayscale in terms of the volume. And when you do look at the volume yesterday, for that first day. Yes, it was the most successful event overall for ETFs. I think that has ever occurred. Even Bloomberg kind of announced that. There, there's a bit of trade issues that were happening primarily from redemptions coming over from Grayscale, people just getting out of Grayscale. So that created some, I will call it a little bit of false uh, narrative in terms of volume. But the fact that just that we've got an ETF on Wall Street, I think that was the win of the day. Very successful, and I think, you know, Fink obviously agreed with it. I think the success was so great that it rattled Senator Warren. Look what she had to say. So this came in. She's basically saying the SEC was wrong on the law and wrong in the policy with respect to Bitcoin ETF. The SEC is going to let crypto burrow further in. And basically what she was doing is saying, we need to stop this now and eliminate this, which would essentially be a unlawful move at this point in fact, Twitter actually flagged it uh, because the American court obviously had already approved the Bitcoin ETF as lawful. So, uh, lawful. So, this was kind of an interesting uh, point of as a lawmaker actually calling for something that was illegal in the in the system that we abide by. A couple other things that came in, of course, was Vanguard issuing a statement saying that uh, spot Bitcoin ETFs not available. Uh, Merrill Lynch was also in this group, but Vanguard's kind of interesting because. Their connectivity into the market, and this may be the very narrative of why they're doing it. If you look at this chart, it's a little blurry, but you can kind of see Vanguard right there in the center. They essentially are a bit of a, midi a middleman, and I think this is something that could be an issue where they could be one of the ones that get disrupted by a lot of tokenized assets and the future of what crypto and blockchain mean to the financial markets. So. Not surprising that they themselves are trying to um, maybe slow this train down just a little bit. Here was, of course, uh, a tweet right here. Vanguard, highly responsible, uh, conservative asset manager that lets people buy things like 3X short on NASDAQ and inverse Kramer ETF. So, I mean, that just shows you the hypocrisy that is out there within Wall Street in general. 
it's a thing I keep telling you guys is that you need to understand it's not your keys, not your coin. You should go ahead, spend the time. Granted, if you're, you know, if you just want something super secure and you want to go the ETF route, okay, nothing, nothing wrong with that. But educate yourself in this market. Understand about self custody. Learn about just going on an exchange and actually getting exposure to the real assets, whether you like Bitcoin or ETH or whatever. Uh, that's really your next step. And I think this only starts the gateway into the next era of how investors are going to be going into the rest of the market. Now, this is Kathy Wood talking about Vanguard and why this would maybe may not be such a good idea for them. Listen in. That's Vanguard, which told us in a statement that um, the spot Bitcoin ETF will not be available uh, for purchase on the Vanguard platform. And we're talking about an institution with, what, $7 trillion under management. Um, what do you make of that decision? Well, consider the source, of course. Uh, I think it's a terrible decision. I think it's a strategic blunder. And what Vanguard is doing is basically saying, you know, the world's not going to change. We're still going to have seven middlemen between uh, merchants and consumers, each one taking a toll. Truth always wins out. Innovation solves problems. There's a lot of friction uh, in the financial system. Uh, and we believe that blockchain technology generally are going to take a lot of the friction out of the system. The other reason I think this is a terrible mistake is, you know, they're going to deprive the investors who stay with them of really the, the first global, decentralized, private, no government oversight, rules-based, critical phrase there, monetary policy, monetary system in history. Again, I think it's a strategic blunder, but again, uh, we're all about disruptive innovation. That's all we do. Right. Uh, this is the most profound disruptive innovation taking place in the world today. You're talking about the transition. It's really a changing of the guard at Wall Street. And I think Vanguard, ironically, is one of the few that will be left behind because this technology is earth shattering in terms of innovation. And over this next decade, this next 10 years, we are talking about a refit of the entire financial system, the monetary system, digitalized, or excuse me, tokenized securities and digital assets overall will start to take place. And I think this is a matter of some who understand it and are willing to take the step forward. And one of them is Larry Fink, who running BlackRock, ironically, understands this. Listen to this next clip because he starts talking about Ethereum. Listen in. Let me be clear. I think ETFs are step one. Step two is going to be the tokenization of every financial asset. So we're looking at uh, Bitcoin. We're looking at ETFs in the right. same manner. These are technological changes that can allow us to move forward. Do you now expect other cryptocurrency ETFs? Meaning, do you think that Gary, and we'll talk to him later, uh, Gary like Gensler, Ethereum. Will, have, will have to approve an Ethereum yeah. ETF. And is that a function of something the SEC has to do? Or do you think that all these things have to go to court first? I couldn't respond to that. I, I, I see value in having an Ethereum ETF. As I said, these are just start stepping right. stones towards tokenization. The moment you buy or sell an instrument, it's known. It's an, on a general ledger right. that is all created together. Um, you want to talk about m issues around money laundering and all that. This eliminates all corruption by having a tokenized system. Jamie Dimon disagrees with you on that, but, yeah. uh, or at least to some degree. All right, so you've got Larry Fink making a very big statement here, and I want you guys to maybe play that section back just a little bit, because what Fink is talking about, as I said, is a refit. And when you think about tokenized assets, you're going to be living in the ETH ecosystem, along with Solana, Avalanche, those three are probably going to be the interesting projects that will make this transition to the monetary system. We've already seen Avalanche's subnet mark, uh, architecture start to make their way in with what we're seeing with JP Morgan. The likelihood of seeing an ETF, I don't think it's an if, it's just a, probably a time issue. And it's a good thing that it's not necessarily being flowed out right now because I think Bitcoin's going to get its window. But I think there's going to be a huge opportunity. The fact that Larry Fink is talking about ETFs with Ethereum, Big, big deal because he understands tokenized securities and the implication this has on the financial system where Vanguard does not. I want to go to Gary Gensler, his statement on this ETF. This will start to surprise you. Listen in. Do you consider the decision uh, historic? And it appears that it's a decision that you made um, either reluctantly or perhaps even begrudgingly. 
we had uh, disapproved a number of these over the years and something had changed. That what changed is not necessarily something inherent to crypto or Bitcoin per se, but what changed was what the courts did. Is that the way to think about this? Well, I, I, again, I mean, we do everything here at the Securities and Exchange Commission within the law and within how the courts interpret those laws. What is your message to investors about Bitcoin now? Bitcoin itself, we did not approve, we do not endorse, and uh, amongst its uh, use cases is really uh, for illicit activity, money laundering and sanctions and ransomware and the like. All right, so I shouldn't say that this is going to surprise you, but it sets up the next stage of what maybe Gensler is really thinking about. And he talks a little bit further in the same interview about Bitcoin and the centralization of it. Listen in. Is it being used as a store of value? It's a speculative, volatile store of value. Is it being used as a payment anywhere? Are we buying cups of coffee with it? Not really. The only payment mechanism it's being used for uh, in, in sort of an, in a primary sense is illicit activity. Which is it? Is it a beanie baby in your view or is it something that has inherent value that's going to be part of the financial system decades from now? Which is it? No doubt there are innovations within this field and those innovations which I taught about at MIT around a ledger system. It's just an accounting system called the blockchain technology. But there's an irony in the midst of this. Satoshi Nakamoto said this was going to be a decentralized system. And, and finance, this has led to centralization. Think about the irony of those who say this week is historic. This was about centralization and traditional means of finance that investors who could already express themselves in Bitcoin, you could already, before this week, buy it through major brokerage houses, but now you can buy it through this thing called an exchange-traded product but the underlying as well, asset still has centralized. Those, those, the underlying asset still has the decentralized, distributed ledger, all those characters. I, I, that sounds like a... I don't know. That does. That sounds no, like no, a no, Andrew. With all respect, it, there's a lot of centralization right. here, and even the underlying ledger right. is largely right. uh, the, the bitcoins produced by sure. a handful of mining uh, uh, companies and the like. All right. So you can kind of see that uh, Gensler. Obviously, the reason he is kind of pointing to this centralization as being one of the maybe one of the downfalls of where this could go. And, you know, he is right. Yes, it can and could have access. But the real, I think, value of what an ETF did was it created this system in a way in which now traditional Wall Street has validated what this asset class looks like. So I think that's the, the bigger win. But he's kind of going a little different direction here. He goes a little bit further into talking about Ethereum. And I just wonder, is Gary doing a little bit of switch here? Listen in. People are now talking about whether there should be an Ethereum ETF and the like. Is that something that you think you would take on uh, proactively? Is that something that ultimately, in the same way that Grayscale had to go to court, is, is that is the, does the court decision around Bitcoin to you uh, act as a precedent on other currencies? I, I look at what we did this week as it's cabin to one non-security commodity uh, called Bitcoin, like we've had gold spot exchange traded products and silver exchange traded products right. in the past and approved in the past. This is cabin just to that one non-security commodity token. So he doesn't really throw ETH under the bus. Uh, you know, if you saw the chart there, it basically had Bitcoin, Solana, Ethereum, XRP. Can you imagine that next to the chair of the SEC on broadcast TV? This is a this is a, a definite big difference, I think, going forward. The question is, is how does this change the future? Does the Bitcoin ETF truly create this landslide event of new investors coming in and then exploring other markets? Maybe that is the possibility. And it looks like uh, Larry Fink thinks that this might be an opportunity because he talks a little bit here about Bitcoin and where its limitations are. Listen in. 
I don't believe it's ever going to be a currency. I believe it's an asset class. You don't believe it ever becomes a currency? No, I think we're going to create digital currencies. We're going to use the technology for it. We're going to use the blockchain. How but important is that, though, to then the long-term value proposition? I believe, you know, I believe it goes up as the, if the world is more frightened, if people have fearful of geopolitical risk, they're fearful of their own risk. It is a asset class that, that protects you. Right. And, and unlike gold, where we manufacture new gold, we're almost at the ceiling of the, most, of the amount of so, Bitcoin when that be created. Hear somebody like, I mean, when you hear somebody like Kathy Wood, yes. who was on our broadcast yesterday, right. say that her base case, base case, is that this turns into a $600,000 a Bitcoin valuation. Base case. I think if it gets that even close to that high, gold will represent even a bigger value. And, 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 and let's be clear, if you think of digital gold, there's going to be a reference point between gold and Bitcoin. All right. So, again, Larry just kind of not necessarily going all in. And he had a little bit of a, a, an interesting tell there. You go back and you can kind of watch the clip there when he talks about it not being a, a, a payment system. And this is simple because I think those who are really starting to put their hands around what digital assets truly are, they're starting to see a little bit of a window open up here around what, you know, tokenized securities will be. And of course, the blockchain, the opportunity of it, they see that. And I think the question will be which projects and what type of technologies are going to be able to make this leap forward. Ethereum is going to clearly be one of the key ones. And along with it, most likely we'll see some Solana, most likely we'll see some Avalanche move into this in the finance system as a whole. I want to go to this last clip because he starts to clarify a little bit more of his thinking. Listen in. When we bought BGI in 2009, we were ridiculed by most of the financial community. But over time, more and more clients started to think about, how do I want to get an exposure? Do I want an exposure in this area or this product? And I could do that through actively investing in ETFs. And boy, did that get a lot of ridicule by many people in the business community. At BlackRock, when we bought BGI, we had $290 billion of ETFs. Today, we have $3.5 trillion. Um, is, and, and then this week alone, we launched the iShares Bitcoin ETF. And so I would say to you, if we could ETF a Bitcoin, imagine what we could do with all financial instruments. We're just halfway there in the ETF revolution, that everything is going to be ETF'd. We believe ETFs are a technology no different than Bitcoin was a technology for, for our asset storage. We believe the next step going forward will be the tokenization of financial assets. Every stock, every bond will have its own basically QSIP. It'll be on one general ledger. Every investor, you and I, will have our own number, our own identification. We could rid ourselves of all issues around illicit activities about bonds and stocks and digital by having a, 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 a tokenization. We could customize strategies through tokenization that is, if it's every individual. We would have instantaneous settlement. Think about all the costs of settling bonds and stocks. Mm. If, if you want to talk about like voting and voting choice and all the things. If, every, if we know every moment who is the owner of that stock and it's now time to vote, every individual who has ownership is identified and they could vote their own shares. Is this the end of mutual funds? It's not the end of it, but I would say the dominant form. So very, you know, big maxi on terms of the future of ETS, but the tokenization of securities, really the, the killer point that he's getting to. And really when you think about that, there's really only one selection and that's going to be an Ethereum ecosystem and layer twos, what we might see with Solana and the evolution of what Avalanche is doing. There are, there are the, those out there, I think they would agree with this, but at the same time, it starts to shift and his process is right. This is a stepping stone that is going to occur and it's going to occur maybe over the next five years, possibly the next decade. But this is the beginning. And I think that's the biggest message going forward to anybody out there looking at digital assets. You, of course, have to understand where the future is now. Hopefully this yesterday and this week has kind of opened up a little bit of a glimpse to that. If you guys are not in the diamond circle, make sure and get in right now. It's one of the best places to get additional alpha. You guys can get podcasts over there, more research, a lot of additional research that we do. We drop right there on the Diamond Circle, which is our sub stack. So just join with the link down below. Catch me out there on X at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on Tech Bath.